following program are those of the host and guests and do not necessarily reflect the policy or position of Owen TV's management, staff, or board of directors. Detroit Basketball! Hello and welcome into Views from the Sidelines. Joey Tysick, Malik Hill, back at it again. Uh, we are now into April, so that means the NBA playoffs are basically right around the corner. Some people consider the playing game playoffs, some don't. Some people say it's a weird in between and it doesn't matter. Um, but that's where we're at, and the playoffs are right around the corner. We have playoffs starting this weekend. Uh, which is exciting. The playing games started last night. Uh, we'll go over some more NFL draft talk, talking more about some of the defensive guys uh, that we haven't talked about, a little bit of the offensive line as well. And then we'll talk about some uh, – there's some some basketball news with Michigan and Michigan State teams, so we'll see how they're doing, and uh, we'll go from there. Uh, Malik, did you get a chance to watch the playing games at all? So I watched the – first one the second one i fell asleep and (laughs) didn't see a single bit of it so i had to watch the highlights the Mm -hmm. next day and yeah i woke up to nothing but reactions about how weird the game was yeah um so i missed most of the hawks heat game so give us a little background what happened in that one uh the hawks ended up winning the game i think it was 116 to like 106 or something like that um But what happened in that game? So, it's it's really weird. Like, Miami from the jump looked like they weren't ready to go. And then as the game went on, they looked sluggish and just tired. And that's kind of weird because a lot of their best players didn't play a lot during the regular season, Mm -hmm. except for, like, Bam and Tyler Hero. But, yeah, Jimmy was forcing it. Kyle Lowry looked ready to go. He – he looked the best he's looked in maybe like a year or two, but it was too late. Like Kyle Lowry isn't supposed to be your saving grace. Yeah. And he had like 19 in the first half, and they stayed within like eight or nine for most of the game. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, the, the Hawks just played well throughout the game. Miami gave them whatever they wanted for most of the game. Trey turned it over a bit too much, but he played – he had a decent game. He didn't hit many threes. They hit shots when they needed to, and shouts out to Sadiq Bay for playing well in an important <laughs> game to get to the playoffs. Yeah, that that is the guy that I said would be a key piece, a glue piece for the Pistons for years, and unfortunately he's gone, but he's proven his worth. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm happy for Sadiq. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was kind of surprising when I looked at the box score and I saw Kyle Lowry with 33 points. Um, cool to see. Um, the one thing that I noticed though on Twitter was a lot of people were saying that Bam Adebayo was basically a non-factor in the game, um, and that was kind of the, the Miami downfall, I guess. Um, would you do you think you would put more blame on him or Jimmy Butler in the game? Because Jimmy struggled for most of the game. You said who or Jimmy Butler? Bam Adebayo. I honestly. <clears throat> The problem with Jimmy wasn't that he wasn't trying. He was trying too hard. That's what it seemed like. He he kept like going into Clint Capella over and over again, and Clint just had the paint locked down, so he wasn't like going to his trusty mid-range. Bam in the first half just wasn't shooting. Mm-hmm. It seemed like he wasn't trying hard. He wasn't playing that hard. I don't know what was up with Bam. I'd give him more of the – Jimmy gets some of the blame, but i give Bam more of the blame. Because it seemed like he was just out of it for a good portion of the first half. Yeah. I don't know what, why, but yeah. Hmm. And so Atlanta is moving on. Uh, that was the automatic seed, right? Which team? Atlanta. So they're yeah, moved, I think they're moved right into the the seven slot. Yep. Um, tonight will determine who's going to play the Heat in that second match. Um, the nightcap was the Lakers and the T-Wolves. 
and it was ugly basically from start to finish. Uh, you didn't miss much, unfortunately. Um, a lot of people will say that it was a good comeback by the Lakers. The Timberwolves blew it. They absolutely had control of the game basically the whole time. Carl Anthony Towns came out just playing super good, uh, hit an early three, made some good post moves. Mike Conley was on fire. He hit six threes in the game. Um, and they just, I don't know what happened. They went away from Carl Anthony Towns. He also wasn't as aggressive as the game went on. Their offense got super stagnant. The Lakers got a little bit of a run, but it was sloppy. Like, there was so many turnovers and things like that. But it, to me, it just felt like the Timberwolves blew it. Anthony Edwards has a, had a terrible game. I think it was 0 of 7 from 3. And I think he only made three shots. He just wasn't very aggressive. And, yeah, it, it was a bad bad look for the Timberwolves. The only thing I'll say is that, I guess, for whoever they have to play now, the Timberwolves will get a home game and they'll have a chance to bounce back. And we saw sparks of what they can do. And that's pretty promising. But it was it was ugly. It, it was ugly. Um, it was fun in the fact that it did go to overtime because Anthony Davis fouled Mike Conley with .1 seconds left at the three. Um, pretty dumb foul by him. But, uh, yeah, pretty boring overall in my opinion. And now, unfortunately, we'll see the Lakers play Memphis, which is a series that I just do not care about. Um, I don't want Memphis to win. I don't want the Lakers to win. Somebody's got to win the series. Dylan Brooks has kind of already called out LeBron James, so good luck with that. Um, yeah, it's just, I, I don't know. It's not one that I care about. Um, so tonight we have the second part of the play in games, the teams that need to win two games to get in. They will play the losers from last night's game. And first up we have, uh, Chicago playing Toronto, which is an interesting matchup. It is in Toronto. So DeMar Rosen going back to Toronto. Uh, for this play-in game will be pretty exciting, I think. There's some storylines there. I kind of like both of these teams. I am a little bit favored towards the Bulls because I like them at the beginning of the season. They just haven't really panned out. I really like Vucevic, of course. And, uh, yeah, I'm kind of I'm kind of curious to see what happens in the game. But for me, I just have a feeling, and maybe this is, again, biases, but... I think the Bulls are the better team. But I do know that Toronto probably has better defense, which usually plays into playoff mode. Um, so we'll see. It should be a good game, but I'm gonna I would go with the Bulls if I'm making a pick. How do you see the game playing out? I honestly think there's no way to pick this using basketball knowledge. That's like, fair. Nikola Vucevic could get thirty and fifteen one game and then like 11 and 7 the next. Mm -hmm. DeRozan might score 30, Levine might score 30, they both might score 20. You you don't know mm -hmm. whatever is going to happen with this team. And with the Toronto Raptors, they haven't taken the leap most people hope they would with this good young core. Mm -hmm. They've like slowly gotten a little better, but for like, I think Fred Van Vliet has hit his ceiling. Pascal Siakam is starting to hit his ceiling after becoming an all-star two years ago and starting in the all-star game, I don't think OG Ananobi is going to be an all-star. They, they've got quality young talent, but nothing special. And when you don't have that special thing, it's hard to get over the hump. So I, I like them more than Chicago, honestly, even though Chicago has a, like three all-star level guys. But I don't know. I – Fred Van, Vliet, Fred Van Vliet has been in these types of situations. Pascal has been in these situations. So has DeMar. Pat Bev is the play-in champion. <laughs> At least he celebrated like it last year in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. He took his jersey off and cried with the fans. Yeah. It's cool to see. I, I'll, just, I'll go the opposite side and say to Toronto. Because okay. I, I like their young core. Mm -hmm. And Chicago... They're just they're stuck in like a weird, just solid place. Yeah. And I I think Chicago fans want more. Mm -hmm. And they just might not get it with this group. Yeah. So and I'm then, gonna go Toronto. Yeah. 
uh, both of these games really should be good. The nightcap is kind of two of our favorite teams, which is unfortunate. Uh, the Thunder playing the Pelicans. Pelicans once again limping into the playoffs. Too many injuries. Zion now saying that he's not going to play till he feels like himself. I feel like that's going to be next season. Yeah, uh, hey, he said it had nothing to do with injury. Also, yeah, he, he said I'm physically feeling all right, but I have to mentally feel like Zion. That's a con- interesting that's, times we're living in, but we're not going to get deep into that. <laughs> Maybe that's an off season conversation. It's tough. Mental health in sports. It's tough, man. Um, but the Thunder making a crazy good run to end their season to make it into the play in tournament. They're kind of a young, well, they're not really, they're not kind of, they are young. Uh, they're a young, gritty team. And then the Pelicans are just, ah, they, I, they can't get over the hump. And it crushes me every time that it happens. Every time Ingram is healthy, Zion is out. When Zion is healthy, Ingram is out. Yes. It never fails. They move, They made the move for C.J. McCollum. You think, okay, they're ready to make a run. They started the season off pretty good. Kind of limped their way in again, like I said. And now here they are. Now, I am going to play more bias. I think that they're the better team again. Uh, I think that B.I. is playing some of his best basketball. Uh, he kind of carried them down the stretch. I think C.J. McCollum is going to be a guy that's going to be able to step up in the playoffs. Um, I mean, Jonas Valanciunas is a force that people always forget about. He's just kind of Mr. Consistent for them. And then, like, they're young guys. Herb Jones has played really good. Trey Murphy has played good for them. Um, They've just gotten production from all over the place. So hopefully that keeps up. But uh, what do you see out of the Thunder that could stop the Pelicans? I'm going Thunder all the way. Okay. I, I cannot believe how good Sam Presti is at choosing the right collection of young talent. He doesn't just pick guys like Houston or many of the other teams that have been in the lottery throughout the years, Minnesota, Cleveland. Every selection he makes has purpose. Mm-hmm. And, the, and when they get on a team, they all seem to fit. Like Jalen Williams out of Santa Clara has been the best surprise of any rookie in the league. He's the real deal. Yeah, You know how much I was down on Josh Giddy mm-hmm. during the draft two years ago. He's the real deal. Josh Giddy is. He's gotten better each year. Shea is a superstar. Yeah. That can't be questioned at this point. And just the other guys are at Trey Mann, Jeremiah Robinson Earl. You go down the list of guys, they all serve a purpose and they play it well. Lou Dort can be a lockdown defender when he's on top of his game and has improved his corner three every year. Like, he's one of the best corner three shooters in the league almost at this point. Yeah. Like 40%. So, they, I, I love their young core. I love the fact that they get to be in a primetime situation like this just so we can see what they've got. Yeah. All of them, this is a first time. Shea was in the play-in playoffs with, with CP3. Mm-hmm. So, he got a taste. And that's when we were introduced to Lou Dort also. Right. So, them two kind of understand what this is like. Mm-hmm. But these are, like, this is a real situation now. I, I can't wait to see how they respond, and I think they'll respond well. Hmm. Yeah, I, I think the Thunder win. Okay. Yeah, it's an it's an exciting game, and like I said, whoever wins is not in. They will still have to play the Kings, or the Kings, the Timberwolves to get in, and then once they've played the Timberwolves, if they do manage to win, that team will be the eighth seed, and they will end up having to play the number one seeded Nuggets in the end. So, it's not great, however you put it. You become an eighth seed at best. Um, I think for the Thunder, this would be huge. Yeah, yeah. For but, the Pelicans, it's it's all right for the Pelicans because didn't they start like 2-10? and 10? Yeah. They started terribly, and they ended up finishing the season well. Something like that. So it, it would be a decent gift for the fans to like be in the playoffs with all the adversity they've gone through. Mm-hmm. But for the Thunder, this would be a huge step right. for a bunch of unproven guys. Yeah. This is basically where we want the Pistons next year yeah, to be in a play-in game. So, yeah, that's the uh, play-in games. The eight-seed matchups, if you want to call it, to get into the eight-seed, those will be played on Friday, and then the playoffs start on Sunday with all the play-in teams getting their games on Sunday. Um, so Saturday we'll have uh, the first game, I believe, is the Warriors and the Kings, which is a 
my favorite, I think, opening opening series to look at. Um, is there any other series that you like the most or anything? You have a favorite? Uh, Kings Warriors. Yeah. Just seeing that like very specific like Northern California series. Mm-hmm. I, I, the Kings, and I'm pretty sure they've never played in the playoffs. So it it's a I, I'm excited to see like when they go to the Warriors arena, how many Kings fans are there? When they yeah. go to Sacramento, how many Warriors fans show up? Mm-hmm. Like the fan interaction and just seeing how loud it gets, yeah, is going to be incredible to watch. And with those, those Kings fans are going to go insane. Yeah, and with those two teams, realistically, they should implement what they did for their All Star game and just first to one hundred and fifty <laughs> points or something. <laughs> Because it, it the might, energy will be there almost the whole there time. There will be some like really high scoring games, I would imagine, uh, which would be cool to see. So, yeah, I, I agree. I think that's that's the best first round series. Suns and Clippers isn't bad. It's it's really interesting. Like Russ versus CP three. Mm-hmm. There uh, there are several veterans that are still trying to like earn some respect. Yeah, like that they're Hall of Famers, but they still don't get the respect of yeah. New York and Cleveland is another one that a lot of people are talking about. In the East, that's the one I'm, I I can't wait to watch. Yeah. Other than that, I'm not too I don't care too much. Uh, but Kings Warriors, I will be watching that every minute yeah. of every I game. figured if Miami won and they went against Boston, I felt like that would be good, but it seems like Miami's just lost what they had. Yeah. They it, there's something that's just gone. Mhm. Yeah. I think Milwaukee will take care of whoever they got. Oh yeah. I, I don't think anybody's beating Milwaukee. Right. Um, all right, let's do, let's stick to basketball. Let's talk about Michigan and Michigan state, and then we'll get into the NFL stuff. So did we talk about Caleb Love at all last year, last week? Did that um, happen? No, no. Okay. So yeah, I think it happened, it happened after right after yeah. the day after maybe. Um, well, Caleb Love is transferring to Michigan. Uh, no longer a Tar Heel. And he fills the void for what we talked about before with Michigan most likely losing Kobe Bufkin and Jet Howard. So we'll have to see. Uh, what are your thoughts on Caleb Love? Fifth year, got potential, but I, never really. If he can get his mind right and balance out what there was between the unbelievably hot, like God level shooting tournament run and the hero ball season that he. I don't know what he did last year. Mm -hmm. He just took a bunch of shots that weren't good for like the entire season every game. But somewhere in between the insane tournament run and the hero ball season, there's a high quality scorer Mm -hmm. and decision maker in Caleb Love. This guy was a borderline five-star recruit, high four-star. The shooting is there, obviously. When he gets hot, nobody can stop him. Yeah, He can get on runs and run off like 20 in a blink of an eye, but the consistency has always been the problem. And if he can be a consistent scoring guard in the big 10, he'll probably be one of the like better guards in the league Mm. because a few have transferred out. Some are coming back for like fifth years, but we don't know what they're going to do exactly. He'll be like top three, most talented guard in the league. He just has to prove he can be consistent. And if he can, then John Howard could possibly save his job. Yeah, because he he needed a move like this from a player of this caliber with this talent mm-hmm. to help him. Because they they honestly both this is both their last chances. Right, Caleb Love, this is his last year of eligibility. Jawan Howard, this is your last chance to show you can do something good here. Mm-hmm. So yeah, they're they're teaming up to try and do something special. Yeah, what would you? I don't want to phrase this. Um... Do you, did you see the the Hunter Dickinson comments? There are some more, some on new like, ones on his podcast over the weekend. I, I've never paid attention to unless something goes viral from from Hunter or anybody really. I don't pay attention. So he was mostly, I mean, I, I would say that I somewhat agree actually, but he was kind of bad mouthing uh, Jawan for basically making the team to try to just build up Jet and be, like, the NBA prospect everybody thought he could be. And, I don't know, he just didn't like it. I'm half and half on that one because Jet was clearly, <clears throat> to start the season, there there was no other player 
that had the ability and the confidence of Jet on that team. Kobe was still figuring it out. Mm-hmm. Jalen Llewellyn clearly just wasn't the guy yeah. from, from the – he was bad from the jump. So it was Jet and Hunter saving the day for most of the first part of the season. Mm-hmm. And Doug McDaniel was a freshman that also was just too erratic. So I don't know what they were supposed to do from the beginning. If they had a better coach, they could have played more balanced basketball and run some plays to get people going. But Jawan didn't do that. Yeah. So I can understand that completely. You could have – gotten people in more rhythms earlier in the season. Like, Kobe kind of figured it out by himself, which is why I don't blame him for going to the league. He had a great second half of the season. But, yeah, I blame most of the stuff this season on Jawan, like 90% of it. So I, I can't fully go against what Tonner is saying. Yeah, I don't think it was meant to be fully built around Jet, mm-hmm. but that's what it ended up being Yeah, because he just wasn't a good enough coach to get everybody else going. Yeah. Uh, any other things that you've seen or heard that Michigan may be going after any players or anything like that? So they're on the list for Matthew Cleveland, small forward from Florida state. Who's a sophomore. He just entered the transfer portal. He was a five star out of, out of high school. Hasn't really lived up to his talent. Very inconsistent shooter. Good athlete. Not great. He, it's kind of hard for me to, to understand why he was such a highly regarded recruit. Mm hmm. Coming out of high school, like he was long, he was long enough and good and like smart enough of a player to dominate. I assume, yeah. But yeah, he has Michigan on his. He has a long list, so I don't know what he's considering really. But also, I I don't know how to pronounce his last name. But the power forward from Tennessee, Oliver, his his last name starts with an N and then is just a bunch of letters. I can't pronounce. Sorry about it. But yeah, number the number thirteen for Tennessee. Had a huge game in the second round of the tournament. Mm-hmm. Had like 28 points and like he went like 13 or 15 or something. He was mostly the best player throughout the season at power forward in the SEC. He's tough. His offense got better as the season went on. He's a good defender. I think he would automatically be the best power forward for Michigan if they picked him up. But I'm not sure if he has Michigan like on his list or what his final list is. So – yeah, if if we got the guy out of Tennessee, the power forward, I would be very happy. Getting Matthew Cleveland, he's still like a guy that's developing his game, so mm-hmm. it's another upside guy. Yeah, kind of like Trey Jackson, who they took from Seton Hall. Yeah, even though he's like a fourth year junior, mm-hmm. he's still a guy that's very talented, but nothing consistent. Oh, I think the other thing that Hunter ended up saying, I don't know if it was after, I don't know if it was an, I can't remember if it was in response to the Caleb Love portal thing or something like that. Um, but Hunter said they'll be lucky to make the NIT this year. <laughs> a lot I, of Michigan I, fans I don't are remember exactly that. how it was phrased. but A lot of Michigan fans are saying that, but also Hunter Dickinson can be a uh, – Yeah. The first part of his name, the mm-hmm. first part of his last name. He can be a bit of that. So he, he will say whatever comes to his mind at the moment, yeah. good or bad. Mm-hmm. And some Michigan fans agree with them. There's a good chance they're bad next year. Yeah. But I still believe with the talent they have and the ta- talent they've acquired through the transfer portal, they will have enough talent and skill overall mm-hmm. to be a team that can make the tournament. Coaching is a thing that is completely separate from that. What Jawan Howard does with them, I'll have to see. Yeah. But the players are there to be good. Yeah. We'll see if there are improvements made at the top. On the other end of the spectrum, Michigan State fans are starting to assume national title, which terrifies me. Uh, Good news, though. Tyson Walker is returning. Malik Hall is returning. uh, I'm sad that they're probably going to be a consistent top top 10 team next year. Mm -hmm. And... They're, so they're going to be really good. They have mostly everybody returning. They're, of course, adding the big guys, uh, the big names, yeah, Xavier, Xavier Booker, Booker and Jeremy, Jeremy Fierce. Fierce. So, and the Cohen Carr, I think that's his name. The, the Yeah, that sounds right. He is probably the most freakish athlete mm-hmm. in this class. Yeah. And guys like that, you've had guys like Brandon Dawson. Mm-hmm. Adrian Payne was a big athlete. Miles Bridges was a freaky athlete. Yeah. This kid, Cohen Carr, 
he has the bounce of Miles Bridges, but his hang time is even crazier. Like he he's gonna do some things that make MSU fans just lose their minds. Yeah. The thing that still scares me is that Matty Sissoko is coming back. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got Xavier Booker, so if he doesn't play well, you can throw the freshman yeah. in. Uh, hopefully, hopefully Booker will develop quickly enough. Um, otherwise, the thing that I've posed is to go get the seven five kid from K- Western Kentucky. He's just a shot blocker. <laughs> just leave him in the middle. It's fine. Uh, yeah. Let people create around him. I think it would be honestly great. Um, but I, I don't know. I, Izzo is not known to use the portal, of course. So we'll we'll wait and see what happens. This um, this is the best case scenario of what an Izzo team is supposed to look like, but we've seen it before. Yeah, you had Jaron Jackson, mm-hmm. Miles Bridges. You had the vets and the high level talent, and Izzo went full Izzo. Yeah, <laughs> and when he does that, everybody notices there's a big problem. Yeah, so it'll be interesting to see. But they're basically returning everybody, uh, besides Joey Hauser, of course. But let me ask you a question. Okay. With all these new arrivals and people coming back, who gets frustrated and who loses minutes? That's tough. Everybody isn't gonna be happy. Yeah. By no. the end of this MSU season, yeah. unless if they win a national championship or make it like a Final Four run mm-hmm. and everything is flowing, then yeah. But I have a feeling some guys won't be happy, especially if somebody. If if Jeremy Fears or Xavier Booker develop, I guess less if Xavier Booker develops, more so if Jeremy Fears develops quickly. If I'm Trey Holloman, I'm hitting the portal. I don't know why he's yeah. still there. Yeah. I don't know why he's still there. Because they're going to be crowded with Tyson Walker, Jaden Akins, A.J. Hogard, and Jeremy Fears. Like, I know that, yeah. you know, they, they're not all, like, traditional point guards and they can play two guards and stuff. But, like you're saying, four guys with two spots – at least somebody's gonna miss out. Yeah, I see a I see a potential Pierre Brooks situation. Yeah, with these with the overload of guards and stuff and, forwards. And the hard thing is like just thinking about it in my head. Like, obviously my bias is always gonna lean towards AJ Hoggard, um, but he's like an Izzo guy. Yeah. So and if, he proved his worth in the tournament. So, right. Yeah. So if he doesn't lose minutes, he's not losing minutes. He's gonna he's playing at least thirty a game. Right. <laughs> but that's what I'm saying. Like, if he's not losing minutes. I don't like. I feel like personally, also, Jaden Akins just brings a certain level of aggressiveness that this team needs. That he shouldn't lose minutes, but he would be most likely the odd man out. Wasn't Taco? Wasn't Tyson Walker the sixth man for like the last two weeks of the season? Somewhat, yeah. So he. Could, I, I feel like that might just be what they go with for the rest of, the, yeah, yeah, this iteration of the team. Might be him and Jeremy Fears taking the second unit. That wouldn't be On bad. On paper, that sounds really if, good. If Tyson Walker has the young guys in the second unit, that could work. Um, yeah, it, it'll be interesting because, I don't know, we've seen some some weird rotation stuff with Izzo, too, so that that's the hard part. Um, I think, obviously, too, that if like Xavier Booker is working out, that Malik Hall could also lose minutes. I, it, This is a big if. Just because, because I put my stock in Malik Hall before. Yeah. And it seems like next year should be a year where that stock kind right. of goes in after what, how he played in the tournament, even though he still made mistakes mm-hmm. that made MSU hate him. Yeah, MSU fans need to chill out on Malik Hall. He's <laughs> the recent he makes bias. mistakes, but come on. Yeah, Xavier Booker is a center that can stretch out and, and hit threes. Yeah, the only one you'll have on the roster probably. Right, Jackson Kohler can step out and hit a jumper, but not as much as like Xavier Booker can. Yeah, and the way he can move, so. Honestly, just because the way that they were playing small ball towards the end of the season and they played Malik Hall in the four a lot of the time, like maybe they play three of their guards, you know, I'm sure there will be some small ball lineups. Like that's what they did in some of the tournament where they played Tyson Walker, Hogard and Jaden Akins. You should only play Matty Sissoko, play him less than 15 minutes. (laughs) Yeah. Let's divvy up those minutes between the bigs and let the guards handle most of the, yeah. Yeah. So it'll be really interesting for this team. Um, but I, I, Magic Johnson has already come out and say they're not looking at just a Big Ten title this year. They're looking at a national championship. So the Expectations are big. I don't know. That starts to get <laughs> yeah. nervy for me. Um, I wouldn't get that far ahead of ourselves. But, yeah, I, I mean, it's definitely a good look for sure to have a, a Sweet 16 team basically get better on paper. 
Um, but we'll just have to wait and see. Should be fun. But uh, college basketball is a long ways away, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, all right, moving on to the NFL. Wait, before we move on, I mentioned Pierre Brooks. Mm-hmm. He transferred to Butler. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think play, him playing for Thad Mata in the Big East, that could be huge for him. Hmm. He could put put up good numbers this year and potentially get drafted. So good for him. Okay. Yeah. And I, I wanted to say something else about college basketball, but it just slipped my mind. Oh, Tyrese Proctor and Kyle, Kyle Filipowski both oh, announced yeah. they are returning for their sophomore seasons. Huge news for Duke. Yes. Them two coming back, plus their high, like, top two re- recruiting class. Duke isn't going anywhere. But they did lose a recruit because of it. True. Um, I can't remember McKenzie his name. McKenzie Mbako. Yeah, I was going to say it's like Mbako. Or something. Yeah, yeah, McKenzie Mbako. So Very he, talented kid, top three kid. He uh, wants to get out of his uh, letter of intent because of the Kyle Filipowski news, so... Oh, it's it's kind of weird. He didn't. He doesn't really play like the same position as them. Maybe he just he just wants to go put numbers up somewhere. Yeah, I don't Could know be. if that's gr- I don't know if that how great that is, but yeah, right. Good for him wherever he goes. Yeah. Okay. Moving into the NFL, there's not too much news. The uh, Aaron Rodgers stuff has basically gone radio silent, which is hilarious to me. Um, the biggest news though, which is wild to me. Odell Beckham Jr. signs with the Ravens. A $15 million <laughs> deal for one year, up to $18 million. That is more than Jamison Williams, Amon Ross St. Brown, and I think it was Josh Reynolds or something. Yes, they're younger and, you know, they're on the like rookie deals, but still. I, I want to give you a full one to two minutes just to, as a Ravens defender, I want to give you a full one to two minutes to just – Let's say what you want to say. This is about literally this. their it, it's so obvious that it's just a blatant attempt to get Lamar back in good terms. That's all there is. Um he, Odell flashed signs of being good uh in two years ago with the Rams when they made their Super Bowl run. Unfortunately got hurt, so we didn't get to see him in the Super Bowl really. Um but he still has that name value, I guess. But for me, like, does it really make them all that better? I don't know. Yeah, obviously, if it brings Lamar Jackson back, then yes. But that's a lot of money for an older wide receiver. And it it makes them on paper look good. But it's definitely desperation. So I don't know if that's going to give Lamar more leverage or what. And if if it's not enough to bring Lamar back, they're just dead in the water. Like I don't know what you do. You just signed a dude for <laughs> up to eighteen million dollars for a one-year deal. Ugh, that's that's risky. And then he's gonna have a rookie quarterback. He's gonna complain. He's gonna be wanting out. Why did he sign the? Like I don't know. It's just it brings too much into it. And then it also like it, even if Lamar comes back, this offense is gonna have to change a little bit. We don't think they're gonna be as run heavy as they have been because Greg Roman's gone, but now they have to like cater to Odell a little bit, which is going to hinder the growth of Rashad Bateman, which in turn, because they're throwing more could hinder JK Dobbins a little bit. I I don't know. Like, I don't know how they're going to change. It's there's a lot of questions. (laughs) That's, that's the thing. There's a lot of question marks. Um, If it all works out, it's great. I, like it looks really good. I honestly don't see. <laughs> I see maybe like one or two scenarios in my mind where this just works out beautifully, yeah, and nothing goes wrong. There's a lot of scenarios where it just goes terribly. Yes, I agree. Um, it's a big risk, but I, I mean, I guess again, I get it because it is it's that desperation mode. Like, what else are you gonna do? How do you get? I Lamar don't Jackson? understand. <laughs> How, how can you not make a deal for just, like, one of the better young receivers in the – how I, is it this hard? I don't know. Every other organization seems like they figure it out somehow. Yeah. If you if they want to make a deal to get a big receiver, they just do it. Yeah. doesn't matter, like, how much the cost is. That's why it's, it ha- it's just a, a name value thing. We saw on Twitter immediately after that Lamar Jackson and OBJ kind of – I don't know if they – exchanged messages is there's a video of them two at a club right 
Congra- so, good. Yeah. <laughs> or if Was anything, that the goal? <laughs> or if anything, they're just good buddies. Lamar's like, Does, hey, I'm going to convince them that if they bring you, <laughs> that I'll come back, and then we just fleece them all together. They pay you. I don't go back, and we're all happy. Listen, what? It'll be incredible if they have those videos of them hanging out and talking and texting, and then Lamar is like, "Yeah, I'm out." Yeah, this is like some big <laughs> scheme. Like, yeah, that's my guy. We hang out. That yeah, is- we'll we'll make him think you'll get the bag, and then I'll just go get my bag somewhere else. I mean, it's kind of smart by them if Listen, that's the real deal. But at this, to me, at this point, it's not going to happen. <clears throat> but if Miami and Baltimore were smart, just do it now. Just swap two in Lamar. <laughs> just just do it. Like, Baltimore doesn't want to be – they've never been the team to air it out and put up a ton of rush yards. To this day, they're still showing. Even with Lamar Jackson, they barely want to be that team. Mm-hmm. They love his running ability more than his passing ability. Yeah. They want to run the ball more. They got J.K. Dobbins. They have a stable of, like, three running backs. They build up their defense. They put so much more money into their defense than anything on their offense. Yeah. They still want to be that type of team. Mm-hmm. If you still want to be that type of team, what do you have Lamar Jackson for? Yeah. Go get just a guy that's accurate that you could potentially protect from injury mm-hmm. with your run game and your offensive line and your scheme. Go get that guy. Yeah. That could just be accurate and won't make a ton of mistakes and just you just want a guy that does his job at quarterback. Right. That's what it seems like in Baltimore. Miami, with the, with that coach mm-hmm. and those weapons, come on. And we get to see Lamar Jackson throw again, probably. Make the, Get him some confidence. Make the logical switch. Baltimore, we've seen what you want. It's what you've always done. Yeah. And Miami wants the superstars. We see what they've done. Yeah, that would be pretty wild. Makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah. On paper. Yeah. In my brain. <laughs> right. But who knows? I don't know anything. I don't work in the league, Joe. Right. I don't know anything. Yeah. yeah it's, a, it's a crazy thing. It's it's hard to, to figure out. Um, but it, it's a weird scenario. You, you would think it would have been an easy, done deal. Um, outside of that, the Lions did make a move just yesterday, actually. Yeah. Uh, they decided they were finally moving on from number three overall, Jeffrey Okuda. He, he was, he was kind of like the sacrifice <laughs> yeah. to, to get all this entire rebuild started. And I feel bad for him. This is, uh, he's one of the last, yeah. like, he was the highest pick for the pencil man, the man <laughs> with the pencil in his ear. I was going to say it's, it was kind of the, one of the final stakes in the uh, Quintricia yeah. era that we needed to just take down. Yeah, like his, I, I don't fully blame him for all of this because there was yeah. the injury and then the team was just terrible. Mm-hmm. So he looked terrible because he was getting cooked by every <laughs> top receiver in the league. Yeah. Then some a hint of daylight comes through. He starts looking better. Yeah. A little bit better. He's still getting cooked, but he's starting to look better. Pick six versus Chicago, playing some tough football. Yeah. We'll take a fifth round pick. Get out of here. <laughs> so yeah, Lions trade Jeff Okuda to the Falcons for their fifth fifth round pick. Yeah, it's okay. If fifth round is kind of like because of how good they've shown they can draft, I think it's it could be a good move. Yeah, but it's also just kind of like we'll take the pick you give us, which is kind of yeah. yeah. I've heard a lot of people say that a fourth round pick would have just felt a little bit better, and I I think I agree with that. Yeah. Where fifth round pick feels like you're kind of like just losing out on a, a potential bust because he's, he's still got potential. Like we said, like he's had a lot of injuries. He, he kind of showed starting some to get signs. His confidence back. Yeah. So I could definitely see the, the only thing, the, the biggest reason why they traded him because they weren't going to pay him his fifth year option. Yeah. He would have been owed about 10 to $12 million. It's way too much for little production that he's had. Um, the scary part is now he's in Atlanta. They got plenty of playing time for him yeah. and a growing good young secondary. Yeah. Um, he's basically gonna. I can't remember who else they picked up. They they got AJ Terrell. Yeah, who's been he's their number yeah, one. He's been a success. But they, I think they picked somebody else up, so he might be competing with somebody else. I can't remember exactly. Um, if not, he'll basically be playing across from AJ Terrell, so he'll get the easier matchups. Um, Do they still have Keanu Neal, or is he gone? I don't believe so. Okay, I was about to say he he was like their guy in the back end for a few years. 
Because they ended up signing guys like Jesse Bates and stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah. I forgot they So I forgot they, they They've made a lot of moves. Which is even, an even bigger help back there. Yeah. So, yeah. They even went after Clayus Campbell, which was weird. Um, but, yeah, they, they've they done a lot of retooling in their defense. So, well, it's a wait and see. Fifth-round pick, maybe we can do something with it. The thing that I would say, fifth-round pick is a perfect time to get Dorian Thompson-Robinson. You said it, not me. <laughs> so that would be great. Um, but the Lions again, we'll we'll talk about that uh soon, two weeks, that uh Lions have a lot of options yeah. in the draft. So we'll 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 see. But the the best part about it, like you said, is kind of just we're moving on from the air. <laughs> and we can start new. Yeah, basically. good luck, good luck to Okuda. No ill will to him. Yeah. He was thrown into a tough situation. Mm-hmm. Started to rebound now. He could be in an even better situation. Maybe. Who knows? Don't the Lions play the Falcons this year? I will check really quickly. I I believe they do. I'm not I'm not for sure, but I, I, I think the that's Detroit on Lions. I think that's on their schedule. Man, this just pulled up the last year's schedule. Because their schedule has a lot of pretty easy teams for the most part. I know that they're playing teams like the Saints and such like that. Um so that would be kind of funny. Especially, though, if, if it's later in the season and they get Jamison Williams on Jeff Okuda or something, that would be pretty wild. I'm going to look real quick, too, because I think I can find it. Did uh, everything? I'll just keep Yeah, they're playing you. Atlanta. Okay. And they don't have, like, dates or anything. You have to, like, go to – I was about to say, all I was seeing was the 2022 schedule. Yeah. They are going to play – they're going to play at Atlanta. Or, no, they're that's a home game. So Jeff Okuda has to come back to Detroit. Um, but, yeah, no ill will. All righty. Let's get into this week's NFL draft talk. We wanted to talk and touch on the trenches. Offensive line, some defensive line. Probably get into some linebackers because the Lions probably looking at that position um, most likely second round. So uh, what's somebody that you wanted to start off with? Offensive side or defensive side, doesn't matter. What's one of the top guys – that we haven't really talked about. Um, give me a second. I, w- <laughs> I wasn't fully prepared. Okay. I didn't. I didn't have my list pulled up. NFL draft. Well, let's just talk about the offensive line first, because okay. those are kind of the easy guys. Uh, it's basically, the top two are between uh, Paris Johnson from Ohio State and Peter Skaronski from Northwestern. It's a couple of Big Ten guys. Who do you think is the better prospect? if you were to go offensive line? Because the Lions have been yeah, rumored that they might do that kind of thing. I, just because I'm a Big Ten guy, uh, I'm going to go Skaronsky. I, I don't know. I just, him being at Northwestern for the past three years, them just being bad, mm-hmm. he was almost a five-star guy. He decided to stay home, and he was almost really good like from the jump and just dominated in the Big Ten for the next two years. I like guys that like offensive linemen specifically Mm -hmm. that start out good early and like keep getting better. Even if the team isn't great, like it kind of shows to me like they, they didn't need the team to be like the culture to be amazing for them to keep developing. Yeah. Like they, they had that self improvement within them. Right. So yeah, I like Peter Skaronsky. Okay. Uh, I mean, I kind of agree. Paris Johnson's kind of the yeah. – he might have a little bit higher upside. Talking about offensive linemen is tough, so yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's hard to go in depth on O-linemen. Right. We only know so much. But I would agree that, like, I think Skaronski is the favorite. That's who I would go with. He seems a little more well-rounded. Um, But Paris Johnson, I, th- I think he has a little bit more upside. Um, He's a little bit better – Um. And pass protection, I believe, too. If I'm to check. Oh, no, Skaronski is a little bit higher still. Okay, so, yep, I just don't know what I'm talking about. But uh, those are kind of the top I was guys. right, Peter Skaronski. Boom. <laughs> Best old lineman in the draft. So, But that, if you want to go over D-lineman, I have a few guys now. Yeah, we can do that. So, outside of the top guys, a few guys that I like, 
First is Dante Stills from West Virginia. He's a guy that came in as a highly touted recruit, four-star kid. He started out getting playing time from the jump as a freshman. Mm -hmm. He was good and like shifted to really. He never hit like the like all American level, but he hit the all conference level. And I like his size. Uh, where'd it go? He's six four, two ninety around there. Mm -hmm. He's very athletic. He's really physical. He has like a lot more power moves than like speed moves. He'll like just go head on and attack an offensive lineman. Really productive on the college level. Mm -hmm. Fan of Dante Stills. And then, where'd his name go? Uh, dang it, I think I lost him. <laughs> well, do you want to talk about... MJ Anderson out of Iowa State. Okay. Another guy that's super athletic. He's 6'3", like 269. So he's like in between edge and like inside lineman. He's more of a defensive end. But he is super quick off the edge. Yeah. He has moves inside or out. But he also is super strong. He will take on blocks to try and stop the run game, and he's a smart run defender. Mm -hmm. So he's a guy that I think if you get him in, like, the fourth or fifth round, mm -hmm. he could be really productive for an NFL team. I don't know if he needs to get much bigger. Like, 270 is is enough when you have that much athleticism and quickness. Right. So I think MJ Anderson could be really good out of Iowa State. Yeah. Um. Looking at some of the guys that the Lions have been predicted, either at 18 or if something ha happens, there's been some that, that, you know, they could fall to the early second round potentially. Um, not super likely. But out of these next kind of guys after Jalen Carter, we got Miles Murphy, Brian Brise, and Kalijah Cansey. Who do you like the most out of all those guys? As a guy that's a college football obsessive and has followed recruiting forever, I'm a big Brian Brzee fan, and it's kind of a weird reason. He was like a – I think he was the number one player in his class, in like the class of 2019. Consistence number one, 6'5", like 280. Mm -hmm. Come, the combination of quickness and, and strength was absurd. Dominant in high school, couldn't be stopped. He stepped into Clemson and was a starter by midseason. And because of injuries – he hasn't been able to be as dominant as his talent says he should be, but he still had a really high level career. He was an all conference guy. I don't remember if he was like a third team all American. I think he made one all American team, mm -hmm. but at his size, I think like six, five two eighty five, almost two ninety. He can pass rush from the D tackle position. He's good in the run in uh, defending the run. Not great. He can improve there. But the gifts that he has, how fast he can run in the open field, how hard he plays, injuries are the only concern with Brian Brzee because mm -hmm. he's had two, I think, major injuries at Clemson. And he's come back from both and played well. But I'm a big fan of Brian Brzee. Kalaja Kansi has kind of become like the favorite in like the everybody's gym of this class. Right. Because he's like six foot in like, 270 yeah but he's stronger and quicker than most o-linemen he goes against unfortunately but he starts to get the, yeah. the aaron donald comparisons yeah and, and his combine numbers were out of this world for like somebody his size too so that's why he also got the aaron donald comparison so i like kalaja Kansi a lot but i i brian Brzee's size and talent along with his ability to keep playing well through his injuries every time he came back mm -hmm. i'm a fan of brian Brzee. I really am. What about the uh, the Michigan man, Smith? I have complicated feelings with Mozzie. Going into his senior season, the hype was real. It was really big hype. He was listed as like one of the top freaks in the country, like out of, co of college football players, athletic freaks, because at his size, like well over three twenty, he moves so much better than a guy his size should. Like he can move, he can jump. He's he's a real athlete. Mm -hmm. The production wasn't all the way there. I think he only had like four and a half sacks. He was a really good run defender, like not elite. He is a really good football player, though. He had half a sack. He only had half a sack? Well, it was, yeah. <laughs> not even a sack. 48 tackles, half a sack. 
What were, what were his tackles for loss? Uh, that doesn't show it on here. Okay. But, yeah, I, he didn't live up to my full expectations. Honestly, Mason Graham, the true freshman that came in, mm-hmm. he had more splash moments than Mozzie Smith, which was great for Mason but kind of bad for Mozzie. But he still is talented enough and strong enough to be able to have a good – I don't know how long of an NFL career, but a good productive NFL career mm. as a rotation like defensive tackle. Right. Yeah, I don't expect him to be any type of star. Um. All right, we talked about a lot of the defensive line, straight up defensive line. Do you want to talk about some of the edge guys? I'm happy to talk about the edge guys. All right. Outside and, a, of- and a linebacker too. Yeah, we'll get yeah. to them. Outside of Will Anderson and Tyree Wilson, who we've kind of talked about, who's kind of that next guy. I guess we talked about Nolan Smith, too, just because his measurables were pretty yeah. crazy. Honestly, the the next best football player is who they have listed on the CS, CBS prospect rankings, Lucas Van Ness. Mm-hmm. Guy out of Iowa, 6'5", 270, crazy measurables at the combine, productive pass rusher at Iowa. He's a guy that came in – kind of raw at Iowa, mm-hmm. just as an athlete, and just continuously got better and better in his next two or three seasons. Yeah. Now he's up to 6'5", 270, and can move like a smaller guy and has all the most of the pass rush moves you need. He's he's more also more power than finesse, but he's so quick off the line that he can beat you with, with speed. So he's a better football player than Nolan Smith right now. Mm-hmm. Nolan Smith is ranked this high because of his – his athletic numbers are the reason. Yeah. His production in college does not look like a guy that was a five star, like top five guy. Yeah, he played that in still eight, has this caliber. The only the limited knowledge or stats that I have, eight games, eighteen tackles, and three sacks. So they're not yeah. like crazy the sacks are pretty good. Um, but Yeah, when when he makes a play, it looks extremely impressive. Right. But they don't happen often. Yeah. Like his size really affects him out there. Like six two 238, it shows. Like, there are times where he has a hard time getting off of blocks. Mm-hmm. Or, yeah, like, his pass, his pass rush moves are good, but not good enough to get past, like, the O-lineman of the SEC that they had. Right. So, it's, it's a, like, a mainly upside pick mm-hmm. with Nolan Smith because the, the production wasn't there in college all the way. Mm-hmm. Uh, one more before we get to the linebackers. So that's interesting to me. What are your feelings on Derek Hall? Because his, num- his numbers jump out at you. I like Derek Hall more than Nolan Smith. Okay. As a as a straight up defensive end NFL prospect, mm-hmm. I think Derek Hall could be a guy that could be like top ten in sacks a few years. I think he could be a guy that could have like eight nine sack seasons, and he's just a consistent guy. Yeah. For a bunch of years, like. What's the the defensive end that played for the Seahawks for a while? War um seventy two was on the Super Bowl team. Dang it, what's his name? His brother was a tight end for the Bears. Oh jeez, um, man, it it's killing it's killing me that my I just brother was his a name. tight end. Yes, he had a brother that played for the for the Bears and was a tight end. Oh, man. His name is slipping me right now, but he was a consistent like seven, eight, nine sack guy for like five, six years. Hmm. I think Derek Hall can be that. And maybe have a few outlier seasons where he has like 11 to 12. Okay. He's that good of a defensive end. Hmm. Yeah, I like Derek Hall a lot. All right. Well, let's finish up with a couple linebackers. Uh, the, kind of the top guys, Drew Sanders, Diane Henley, Jack Campbell. People are throwing Trenton Simpson in there too. If um, the Lions can get Jack Campbell, they need to get him. Okay. I, He's I'd your really favorite think. out of the group? Yeah. Okay. I, I'm a big Drew Sanders fan as like a edge slash linebacker type of player. Like I, I see him as like a TJ Watt kind of type, which is why he's ranked number one. Yeah. I think he can wreak havoc off the edge, and he's really good in the run game too. But as a straight-up linebacker, I think Jack Campbell is – I didn't think he was athletic as he tested out at the combine. Mm-hmm. Like he has 4-5 speed. He can really – and it shows on tape when you actually watch. He can really run from sideline to sideline. In coverage, he's decent, mm. but he can get better at that. With his size at 6'5", 250, and his ability to move, he has a high IQ. He's physical. 
and he can move. And he's only like 22. Hmm. That paired with 6'5", 250, I think is... Yeah. You put him next to Malcolm Rodriguez, you got a really nice pair. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of Jack Campbell. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, The other one that I always like um, the idea of, because you can get them later, uh, what's your thoughts on Noah Sewell? What if we had both the brothers? That would be awesome, honestly. But if you could snag him in like the third round, that would be cool. But his his physical gifts, also he's another guy where his physical gifts outweighed his talent. Mm-hmm. I mean, outweighed his numbers. Because he stepped into college at like 6'2", 250, can run, can do everything. And he started from the jump. And he was good from the jump, but there was no like next level that he hit. Like he came in, was like second, third team, all conference level. And he never became an elite linebacker. So I'm I'm not sure exactly what that next thing is. Maybe he just had a certain ceiling, but he's an extremely just as athletic as Penny, mm-hmm. but at six two two fifty, he can run, he can do everything. Yeah. But yeah, the consistency will probably be his biggest issue. But yeah, taking him in the third round, it'd probably be a nice pick. Any other linebackers you want to mention? Ivan Pace from Cincinnati. He's only 5'11". He's 230 pounds. I think he's a baller. You watch Ivan Pace play. He is just, he's at the ball almost every other play. Mm -hmm. He racked up tackles in his career at Cincinnati. He doesn't miss tackles. His physicality is incredible to watch. He's super quick to the ball. He just knows how to make plays as a linebacker. Yeah. I I really hope somebody drafts him. 13 games, 137 tackles, and 10 sacks. He is a problem. (laughs) Ivan Pace needs to be like a top, like, four-round pick. He might slip to the fifth because of his size, Mm -hmm. maybe even the sixth, but you put him on that field, he's going to make plays. He's like a more athletic Malcolm Rodriguez. Like, his IQ is through the roof. He gets there quickly. I, I, I'm a big fan of Ivan I, And I will have to take your word on it because you did mention Malcolm Rodriguez last year, and Lions got him, and he's turned out great. Yeah. So, Cool. All righty. That is already time. Um, we're getting closer and closer to the NFL draft. Um, next week we might do sleepers or something like that, um, get maybe some of our final thoughts, and then the week after is when we'll do the mock draft. Um, just the day before the draft. Um, Next week, we'll be able to talk about NBA playoffs because all those series will be started. And, uh, yeah, that'll probably take up most of our time. And then, of course, if any other NFL news happens, if Lamar Jackson ever gets signed, if Aaron Rodgers ever gets talked about being traded, some of that stuff might not come to fruition until after the draft or during the draft. We'll have to wait and see. But for now, this has been Views from the Sidelines. We'll see you guys next time. Are you ready for the Sports Illustrated cover of Tyler Huntley and Odell Beckham proving the world wrong? You ready?